Tonight we begin a new feature here on KXLY4, a chance to hear your questions about how the world works and bring you along as we find out the answers. Well, this first installment brings back a story that dominated our lives last fall, the swine flu pandemic. It was expected to kill millions, and the CDC even predicted 40% of the population would be infected. But we don't hear about it anymore. Tonight, you've asked, what happened to the swine flu? And KXLY4's Melissa Luck says, good question. Here in the newsroom, we have done a ton of stories about the swine flu since the outbreak began last year. This is our news archive system. I just want to see how many swine flu stories we did here at KXY in 2009. There's your answer. 1,733 swine flu stories last year. We're only a couple of months into 2010 so far, but the CDC says the swine flu is still very much a reality. But we did the same search for swine flu stories this year, just five swine flu stories. Remember when you couldn't turn on the TV without hearing us talk about the swine flu? Swine flu. Swine flu. I know, it's been a while, before Christmas, even before Thanksgiving. In fact, all the way back to April. But who could forget when the swine flu fears had people lined up for hours outside the Spokane Arena? If you're over 25, you need to have an underlying condition. Desperate for the few swine flu shots available. Is it a surprise to you that it's declined so much so quickly? Um, no, it's typical when you have a pandemic to have a, have a peak and then a, a rapid uh, decrease in the number of cases. That's what people understood in 2010. But just a year earlier, in 2009, they had a completely different idea. Where did their fear of the swine flu come from? Remember, when you hear someone refer to H1N1, they're also talking about the swine flu. So let's take a look at the origins of the swine flu panic. The Centers for Disease Control this past week quadrupled its estimated H1N1 flu virus death toll to roughly 3,900 between April and mid-October. For more on the outbreak, we are joined by Dr. Anthony Fauci, the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Dr. Fauci, good evening to you. Good evening. Despite those numbers we just gave, this past week in this country, the reported number of cases of H1N1 were down. Should we be encouraged by that? Uh, I think it's really premature to get any encouragement for that. There was a little blip down in the, in the pattern of the, of the number of cases. But since flu is, is eminently unpredictable, I think it's really dangerous to make any assumptions as what's going to happen over the next few weeks or months. It could have peaked and then might come down. That would be wonderful if that happens. Or it could peak and then taper off like this, which means there'd be many more cases of influenza. Or it could peak, come down, and then in the middle of the winter, we could have a second wave. So I think we ought to refrain from making any kind of conclusions about the patterns based on a single week's tally. That was Tony Fauci in 2009. Now we're going to return to 2010 and see how the story evolved. As you watch these clips, look at the upper right-hand corner and see the date. When you see 2009, that's when the issue was in panic mode. When you see 2010, that's when people figured out what was really going on. There'll be one other clip from 2020 at the end of this video, which I think you'll find very interesting. Deadly influenza pandemic or nothing worse than a mild case of the flu. Here in Thailand, their swine flu vaccination program has just begun, but in other parts of the world, serious questions are being raised about the handling of the pandemic. Health officials around the world had believed swine flu could kill hundreds of thousands, if not millions. They introduced emergency measures and spent in excess of $20 billion on vaccines. But now Wolfgang Vodard, head of health at the Council of Europe, says they got it wrong. Not only that, they were misled by the World Health Organization and unduly influenced by drug companies. The WHO, in cooperation with some big pharmaceutical companies and their scientists, redefined pandemics and lowered the alarm threshold. Those new standards forced politicians in most states to react immediately and sign marketing commitments for additional and new vaccines against swine flu and spend billions of dollars to catch up. France is one country feeling the prick of embarrassment. Officials spent a staggering $1.25 billion buying 94 million doses of H1N1 vaccine. So far, only 5 million have been used. Now the country, like many others that bought big, is trying to sell off surplus stock. Having committed to buy the vaccines, 
Dr. Vodag says health officials then sought to justify their decision. Never before the search for traces of a virus was carried out so broadly and intensively. Besides, many cases of death that happened to coincide with seropositive H1N1 lab findings were simply attributed to swine flu and used to foster fear. The World Health Organization had been hinting about raising the alert level for some time, but it waited until the virus had spread across more than one continent. The WHO's Director General Margaret Chan announced that almost 30,000 confirmed cases have been reported in 74 countries on five continents. We are in the earliest days of the pandemic. The virus is spreading under a close and careful watch. No previous pandemic has been detected so early or watched so closely in real time right at the very beginning. So what happens now? Dr. Chan says the official declaration of the pandemic means drug manufacturers will speed up development of a vaccine although one is not expected to be available before September. Until then, Dr. K.G. Fukuda of the WHO is telling countries to maintain vigilance. At some point, it will become established in most of the countries around the world, which means that there will be a lot of people who will have gotten infected over the next one or two years, and then we'll begin to see immunity build up in the population. The virus raised the roofs, and this one, like all influenza viruses, can change the rules without rhyme or reason at any time. This past week in this country, the reported number of cases of H1N1 were down. Should we be encouraged by that? Uh, I think it's really premature to get any encouragement for that. There was a little blip down in the, in the pattern of the, of the number of cases. But since flu is, is eminently unpredictable, I think it's really dangerous to make any assumptions as what's going to happen over the next few weeks or months. Now, we wanted to hear from CDC when we, when we uh, found that these figures, the high negative rate among those cases considered to be most likely to be swine flu. And they wouldn't answer a freedom of information request that we filed. They wouldn't answer questions that we posed to them. And we approached Dr. Frieden, who had CDC at an unrelated news conference, to confront him about this lack of information. Here's that tape. I'm Dr. Frieden. I'm Fernando Suarez with CBS News. I work with uh, Cheryl Atkinson from our investigative department. Um, this is on a separate issue. For weeks, we've been trying to get um, information from your office on the state-by-state -state breakdown of the H1N1 virus and your office has been obstructing the release of that information. Can you assure us that you would personally look into this so that we can get that public information released today? Uh, we will certainly look into it. We do work in partnership with states and coordinate with them on release of data that is data reported to CDC by state government. So it's a question of coordinating with the states on release of information. Uh, I'd like to see if there are other questions perhaps Dr. on the... One last question. question. The, the um, information is available to the CDC right now. What can we do to get that information released to us today? Your office has stopped communicating with us about this issue, so we had to come down here to ask you personally to get involved. I am aware of the issue. We are discussing with states because some of the states have provided to us uh, preliminary or incomplete data and we need to make sure that any data we release to the public is accurate and that the entities that have reported are comfortable that that data actually represents what they intend to report. So once we are comfortable in that, we will be happy to release it to you. I do not know whether that will be today or not. Uh, are there other questions about uh, the prevention, putting prevention, communities putting prevention to work? It could have peaked and then might come down. That would be wonderful if that happens. Or it could peak and then taper off like this, which means there'd be many more cases of influenza. Or it could peak, come down, and then in the middle of the winter, we could have a second wave. So I think we ought to refrain from making any kind of conclusions about the patterns. The Council of Europe will launch a probe into pharmaceutical companies accused of manipulating swine flu data. This follows a claim by a renowned German scientist that vaccine manufacturers pressured the World Health Organization organization into declaring a swine flu pandemic seeking to increase profits. Marty Laura Emmett has more. It was supposed to be a deadly pandemic, but it was so far nothing more than a serious cold. 
and it's left a lasting headache as a debate rages over whether pharmaceutical companies deliberately misled governments about the seriousness of swine flu to make them stockpile vaccines. The legal standards organization, the Council of Europe, will gather the arguments. Britain has spent a fortune on preparations. We've caused a great deal of stress to the population. People are very anxious about it. And we've distorted the priorities of our health service. And I believe when we have a thorough investigation and we look at this, uh, we'll discover that that's the story. The world has been subjected uh, to a stunt uh, for their own greedy interests of the pharmaceutical companies. Health expert Gawain Tola says farmers will be farmers, and it's governments who should have been less gullible. Pharmaceutical companies, of course, have a huge economic interest in encouraging concern of health. I think you have to blame the governments for going along with this, for, for not having natural skepticism of the claims of somebody who has a financial interest. The government wants it to be seen to be doing something useful. Uh, and, in, and in that way, they encourage the fear that then forced them to act. It could have peaked and then might come down. That would be wonderful if that happens. Or it could peak and then taper off like this, which means there'd be many more cases of influenza. Or it could peak, come down, and then in the middle of the winter, we could have a second wave. So I think we ought to refrain from making any kind of conclusions about the patterns. Trade-off, you just mentioned, obviously, the economic pain. What do you think the right balance is between the trade-off of protecting people's lives and the economic hit? I mean, do you see a situation where the global economy could be virtually at a standstill for a year or even more? Well, it won't go to zero, but it will shrink. Global GDP is going to take, uh, you know, probably the biggest hit ever. You know, maybe the Depression was worse or 1873. I don't know. But in my lifetime, there, this will be the greatest economic hit. But you don't have a choice. People act like you have a choice. People don't feel like going to the stadium uh, when they might get infected. You know, it, it's not the government who's saying, okay, just ignore this disease. And, you know, people are deeply affected by seeing these deaths, by knowing they could be part of the transmission chain. And, you know, old people, uh, their parents, their grandparents could be affected by this. And so you don't, you know, you don't get to say, uh, ignore uh, what's going on here. There, are, there will be the ability, particularly in rich countries, to open up if things are done well over the next few months. But for the world at large, normalcy only returns when we've largely vaccinated the entire global population. And, and so, you know, although there's a lot of work on testing, a lot of work on drugs that we're involved with, you know, trying to achieve that ambitious goal, which has never been done for the vaccine, that rises to the top of the list. Eventually, what we'll have to have is certificates of who's a recovered person, who's a vaccinated person, because you don't want people moving around the world where you'll have some countries that won't have it under control. Sadly, you don't want to completely block off the ability for those you know people to go there and come back and move around people to go there and come back and move around so eventually there will be sort of this digital uh immunity proof uh that you know will help facilitate the global reopening up we are joined by dr anthony fauci the director of the national institute of allergy and infectious diseases dr fauci good evening to you Good evening. Despite those numbers we just gave, this past week in this country, the reported number of cases of H1N1 were down. Should we be encouraged by that? Uh, I think it's really premature to get any encouragement for that. There was a little blip down in the, in the pattern of the, of the number of cases. But since flu is, is eminently unpredictable, I think it's really dangerous to make any assumptions as what's going to happen over the next few weeks or months. The virus rides the roofs, and this one, like all influenza viruses, can change the rules without rhyme or reason at any time. There will be the ability, particularly in rich countries, to open up if things are done well over the next few months. But for the world at large, normalcy only returns when we've largely vaccinated 
the entire global population. 